the Supreme Court kicking off its new term today with four women on the court for the first time in U.S. history, including the first African-American justice, Katanji Brown-Jackson, sworn in on Friday. The four women justices posed together Friday to mark the occasion. Extraordinary picture. But the court just starts the session with the conservative majority court facing big questions about its own legitimacy after overturning Roe v. Wade, as it takes on major new cases this term involving race and affirmative action, voting rights, the environment, gay rights. And joining me now, NBC News senior White House correspondent Kelly O'Donnell, former U.S. attorney and deputy assistant attorney general Harry Littman, who was once a Supreme Court law clerk himself, and Linda Greenhouse, former New York Times reporter who has won the Pulitzer Prize for her reporting on the Supreme Court. The paperback version of Linda's book, Justice on the Brink, a Requiem for the Supreme Court, is out tomorrow. And Kelly, first to you, the court taking up some really consequential cases this term. Members of the public are allowed inside the court for the first time since the pandemic in 2020. The big fence came down for the first time after the abortion protests. So what was it like inside there today? Well, there was definitely members of the public. There was some spacing in the seating allotted for them. Justices Kagan and Sotomayor wore masks. Others did not. There were some masks in the uh, audience of those who were watching. But what was certainly notable in this first case today, Justice Katanji Brown Jackson engaged right away. She was asking many questions of the lawyers who were here for a case that deals with water rights and the EPA, and could there be more federal regulation of property rights when it comes to water. And it was certainly interesting to see how she engaged quickly, and other justices on the bench referenced some of her questions, and so clearly she was right in the mix on her first day on the court. And of course, today's case is just the first of many going forward. Uh, the justices will hear cases that will deal with issues like uh, race when it comes to college admissions, affirmative action, that will deal with uh, Harvard and the University of North Carolina. They'll also deal with how state legislatures could play a bigger role in elections. They'll look at voting rights in the state of Alabama. They'll look at the issue of can a private uh, employer, a web designer in Colorado, not provide services, creative services for gay couples, but do so for heterosexual couples under the issue of free speech. So there are lots of cases coming up in the weeks and months ahead that will have a big impact on American life. Today was day one, and in many ways it was getting back to what was once normal before COVID, but it's also a new court uh, with new faces on the bench and definitely uh, the impact of what happened in the last term certainly felt by many. Andrea? And Linda, the Gallup poll showing a 20-point drop in the public's approval of the court since 2020. The justices themselves have been publicly debating the court's legitimacy, Kagan versus Roberts. I mean, really pretty extraordinary public debate. What are you watching for in this term? It's a crisis for the Supreme Court, you know, and, and I think what, what people need to keep in mind is that what happened last term and what's going to happen this term inevitably, Andrea, is no coincidence. I mean, the, the book that you were nice enough to, uh, to put up the image of, really, what I, I, what I tried to do there was give a roadmap to what this new super conservative, super majority plans to do. They're ticking it off case by case. Kelly mentioned affirmative action and voting rights. These are have, have deep roots in conservative judicial thought going back for years, and it's all coming to ground now. What this means for the court, as the court diverges from where the public wants it to be, the court knew very well when it decided Dobbs in June, the case that overturned Roe against Wade, that some of the 80 percent of the public told pollsters that they did not want the court to do that. The court did it anyway. So it's no surprise that people are rather quickly losing faith in the Supreme Court. And Harry, it seemed as though this was a pent-up conservative desire to take on cases that were pretty well decided. Affirmative action was decided by Bakke in the 70s. You know, the EPA, really? <laughs> its ability, I mean, the EPA came under Richard Nixon, but it seems as though post-Bork, there have been decades of frustration by the conservative majority and what you seem to see in the Dobbs decision by Alito and by Clarence Thomas was like, let's go get, go after these issues. 
I think that's exactly right. They seem like, you know, they could be taking it methodically. They're probably there for a generation, but they're like starving diners at last call. They are rushing forward. They took it very far and very fast last term. And the point that Linda makes, just to put an exclamation point on it, and Kelly as well, they also set their own agenda. So each of these cases that they took, one, they didn't have to, and two, almost certainly all observers think are going to come out in ways that really represent another lurch to the right, uh, and in, in some instances, like the affirmative action cases, undoing decades of precedent. And Linda, to make that point also, it seemed to me that, the, uh, and I, it's a point that I think Harry was making, some of these cases, like the Colorado case, were not really ripe. They didn't, that woman, the baker, was not being prosecuted by state officials. They didn't have to come to the court. It was like an eagerness to take that on, even though gay rights was pretty well decided. It, it, it's, it's more than an eagerness. You're absolutely right. It, it, it's a hunger. And it's, you know, it's get it while you can. And they have, they have the votes. Uh, we saw that in, in Dobbs. I remember the the, the first line of, of the analysis I wrote for the New York Times after Dobbs came down was uh, they did it because they could. And, uh, you know, back a, a year ago, when more than a year ago, when the court decided to take Dobbs, uh, knowing full well that they finally had the votes that they'd been uh, collecting uh, for years. This was an agenda item for years. And uh, you know, back in my book, I tracked the the months that it took for them to really coalesce and decide to, to get into this case, uh, Harry's absolutely right. Uh, there are very few cases that the court has to take. There are a couple uh, jurisdictionally that the court has to take. But basically, this is reaching out and, and inviting, saying, bring us the case, bring us the vehicle so that we can do what we want to do. And briefly, Harry, the issue of legitimacy, the court unlike the other branches, the executive branch has an army to enforce its, its decisions if it had to. Uh, the legislative branch has its powers of the budget. The court has only its respect and legitimacy and the, the respect it has earned over you know, the centuries from the, the public. It's so true, and that's probably why this is one of the, maybe the greatest crisis in the court's history. And of course, it comes in the wake of some very brass knuckle politics that installed the current conservative majority. So when people perceive, as Justice Kagan said over the summer, that there are not only big changes, but the changes are driven just by changes in personnel, that really draws from the court's goodwill and capital, and it's very low right now. But it's very interesting from your observations, you were in the chamber, that Katanji Brown-Jackson yeah. is no shrinking violet like Sotomayor as a new justice. They're right in there. She took her swings first, first time, definitely, definitely. Thank you so much. Harry Thanks Lincoln, for having it's me. It's great to see you. Linda Greenhouse, thank you so very much.